Let's move on to later Buddhist art. And we'll start with the Kushan period. And this will be the first Buddhist art that we're going to see uh, that actually has images of the Buddha. Uh, so the Kushans were a nomadic people. Um, and O'Reilly says they're Caucasian, whatever that means. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that is a um, current term uh, for referring to people. Uh, so they may have also been from Iran. And they ended up in the Gandhara region in what is today uh, Northwest India. And they practiced Mahayana Buddhism, so this greater vehicle with bodhisattvas. So you can kind of understand why they would want to work towards imagery since it's a very um, kind of personal, as in personal images uh, based way of, of thinking of Buddhism. And um, the styles that were developed here. Um, made their way to China uh, and eventually Japan uh, through the Silk Road and also west into Afghanistan, which we'll look at towards the end of this lecture. Um, so in Kanisha, Kanishka, the city, uh, artists were trained in Roman styles. So remember, the Greeks had invaded in the 4th century BC, uh, and then the Romans afterwards um, had established relations uh, with these areas. And um, we see the artists were trained in these styles. And when the first, they make the first images of the Buddha, they're in Roman styles. So Mahayana Buddhism and Roman influence, we call that the Gandhara school. Um, and we see a relationship between the way that Apollo is portrayed and Buddha is portrayed. And this is exactly what happened in Christianity uh, the first images of Christ were based on Apollo. So this makes sense. Uh, you can see in both Christianity and Buddhism, you have this kind of nimbus behind the head, uh, just like Apollo would have the sun uh, when he was being portrayed sometimes. So if you weren't able to see the um, Greek and Roman influences or Greco-Roman influences, take a look at the what we're seeing here and take the extra cut up board and say, well, what's similar between these two? Uh, and there's a lot of similarities. Um, so if you see somebody else had one similarity, you know, try to come up with some other ones. So we have um, the differences is that the Buddha has particular iconography towards the Buddha talking about his life and a spiritual journey. So the Ushanisha, which is the hair knot, that's his auxiliary brain, and that represents a spiritual brain that he developed after becoming enlightened. Same thing with the urna, which is the third eye. Uh, the mudra, which is the hand gestures. We talked about some of these things before, but you can see them first developed here. Uh, so again, take a look at the head of the Apollo and the head of the Buddha, and tell me what you can see that's similar. Uh, when we look at later styles, we'll th see things that are more in line with what other South Asian art had been doing at the time. But these ones for now um, have this Greco-Roman influence. So this is the Fasting Buddha. There's a really good example over at the Detroit Institute of Art. Um, and the classical style, style dies with the Roman Empire, and it has little influence on later art, and instead, instead we'll see a South Asian style in Buddhist art. So it develops kind of slowly. Uh, we have the Matura style first, uh, and this is Kanishka the uh, first, and his name is the great king. The king of kings is Majesty Kanishka is what it says there. His head was likely bearded. He's an authority symbol. Uh, so this type of art isn't South Asian art. It's more like um, where Kanishka is from. But we look at the art that's, that's being commissioned during his reign, and we see a more Indian style. Um, there's a lot of the iconography we'd seen before, like the lions uh, in the Bodhi tree, which is kind of pictured here. You can see it a little bit. Um, the Brahma, which you see here, uh, and then Indra, who is broken off on this particular piece. Uh, the Buddha is doing the Abhaya Mudra, which means fear not. Uh, he's sitting in the lotus position. Uh, on a bed that's lotus petals. Uh, but you can see how his body is quite different than what we saw in the Greco-Roman style. It's softer in the cloaks that he's wearing. 
um, are see-through. So this is more in line with what we saw in ancient Indian art. We can even see the prana and the kind of soft belly on him. This one, we see the same thing. So you can get an idea what the original piece in the last slide looked like and some cute little lions. So the Gupta period is where we see the style that develops that had an influence worldwide. So the Kushan declines uh, and the Gupta Empire kind of moves into some of that area. We have Gupta rulers from about 320 to 620 CE, uh, Chandragupta and Chandragupta II. And this is sometimes called the classical Indian style, but I put the quotes up for that because um, I think you should always be skeptical when somebody's talking about a classical style of art, because um, that's usually a value judgment, uh, and it doesn't necessarily have like a, a meaning that is, is useful for us in understanding um, art styles. So in this one, we see the Sangati, um, which is a garment, a very translucent, see-through, delicate garment, a sun or a nimbus behind with some more details, six disciples underneath turn the wheel of law, um, winged lions, um, and again, sitting in a lotus position, doing the wheel of law, the Dhamma Chakra Mudra, um, and sitting on lotus petals. And he has all of the, the qualities of the Buddha. Um, so you can see here the six uh, followers turning the wheel of law, uh, the lotus position on the lotus petals. Uh, when we get in close to the head, we can see this style that's sometimes called snail shell. Um, and if we take a closer look at that, um, it's not exactly known where this came from, uh, but there's a lot of different ideas. One is that it's from poetry. Others talk about it representing some sort of infinity. Uh, so in Hinduism and in South Asia, there was like a, a big kind of emphasis on mathematics. Um, so that may have had an influence on Buddhist art then. Um, the brow, again from the poetry, had been compared to arc of a bow, so we have this very much different than what we saw in the Greco-Roman style. The eyes, a fish or a lotus bud, uh, we can kind of see that there. And the, and the lotus bud makes sense because we already talked about that. But the fish, perhaps it's representing, like when you see fish, they don't seem to be attached to anything. Their eyes are just kind of blank, uh, always open, so perhaps that's why they're showing it. And then downcast and meditation a bit of a smile, uh, and that represents Buddha's compassion and understanding. So when Buddhist art moves to personal portrayals of the Buddha, then we see this kind of like relationship between the audience uh, and the artwork um, that's created by these things like the smile um, and this kind of peaceful look. So the hair balanced of textured and smooth, uh, snail shell curves is what it's called. And why am I showing this line? Because it's cute. So Buddhist art spread out. Uh, we'd already seen uh, the Wei Dynasty um, in uh, China, but this is in Afghanistan, and this is a colossal Buddha. Uh, it no longer looks like this, and I'll explain the story. Uh, but this is a rock cut um, from the living rock. And to give you an idea of the size of this thing, uh, it's 180 feet tall, um, the Statue of Liberty, uh, if you had ever been there, it's 151 feet tall, so quite a huge one. Uh, this one's known as the Body of Bliss or the Buddha Essence Buddha. Uh, pretty common uh, for these kind of rock-cut temples. And this one may have influenced the ones that we saw in the Wei Dynasty and at other places because there was miniatures that spread along the Silk Road that people sold and may have caused um, monks to get in contact with the other monks that worked on this one. Uh, so that's the way it looked before 2001. Uh, then um, it was destroyed by the Taliban. Um, so I should give some background because there's an easy way to interpret this story and say, oh, this is evil Islam uh, and they're reactionary and they hate all religions. But I think it's more complex than that. Certainly people that influenced uh, the leaders in Afghanistan to let this happen uh, to destroy this particular sculpture were reactionary. Uh, but the leaders themselves were dealing with a lot of pressures uh, that were extremely difficult. Um, so this is before 9-11, 2001, and before the U.S. went to war with Afghanistan. Uh, but going back into 2000, um, the Taliban government, you know, was 
was basically in opposition um, to the United States. They were very anti-imperialist. Uh, they weren't interested in U.S. influence at all. Uh, so the U.S. had already been developing, tried diplomacy at first, but eventually um, there was talk, and the Taliban heard this and took it seriously, uh, that the U.S. could possibly invade. There was probably no chance of that at that time, um, before 9-11, uh, but there was still concern, and that caused um, the leaders of the Taliban, who at first didn't want to let this Buddha be destroyed, um, let the regional leaders go ahead and do it. Uh, so when uh, the world heard about this, uh, because there was a conflict between the government uh, and the regional leaders who wanted to destroy it, uh, Japan offered money to take the thing apart, brick, you know, cut it into pieces and move it. Uh, India offered to move them, uh, but it ended up going forward anyways. Again, this pressure from the outside, I think the Taliban government was was very influenced to try to get as many allies as possible. So they allowed this to happen. Um, and this was the result. Um, so a terrible result, uh, but it had its influence. Uh, and we've already seen it in some of the art that we've seen in other areas, like in China. So moving to some Nepal and Tibet, uh, this is a Tonka. And this is one of the few... Uh, works of art that we talk about in this class, well, maybe the only one that actually are in possession and in possession of, not this particular one that we're looking at, uh, but I have one on my wall at home. Uh, and I acquired the one that I have because um, my former landlord uh, was Russian. She was from Siberia. Uh, and her grandparents had been visited by Tibetan monks. Uh, and they left the Tonka with her. Uh, how the Tonka is often used, we're going to see it in, in a couple of contexts, but one of the ways it's used is it's rolled up um, and then it's taken from place to place and it's using, used um, for a didactic purpose to teach people about Buddhism. So um, these Tibetan monks had given it to her grandparents. She found out I was our historian and she gave it to me. Um, so kind of lucky there. Um, so monks escape. Uh, an invading uh, Muslim empire in 11th to 12th century, 12th century. And they combine Ban, which is the indigenous um, religion in Tibet and parts of Nepal, with Mahayana Buddhism. And they come up with this very, probably the most complex form of esoteric Mahayana Buddhism. Um, so in this one, we see like these, these um, the compositions in these probably might remind you of medieval art from Europe. Um, so the idea is to show kind of like iconography. It's not really important to show space or anything like that. Um, remember, these are being used for a didactic purpose, also to beautify the places that they're used. Um, so in this one, we have Manjushri. Uh, and holding a symbol of wisdom, the lo lotus blossoms, which equals purity and then a sword which cuts through um, things that are stopping you from getting into enlightenment. So we get in a little bit closer and we can see portrayed in a typical uh, bodhisattva way. We'll see how uh, earlier Hindu art um, in next week's lecture and the last week's lecture uh, may have influenced these styles, uh, but shown as basically a prince with jewels and such. Uh, and that's the way bodhisattvas are. You know, they're good in life, but they want to help people a little bit later on. So the sword cuts through ignorance. The scarf uh, represents a vibrant spirit. So some of these are kind of inspirational. Um, you want to be inspired. Other ones that show demons and such, it's the same idea. Um, demons can sometimes put barriers in your way, but they can also be helpful to you. Uh, so there definitely isn't a strict dichotomy um, in this way of thinking. So the um, government that formed in Tibet um, is called the Lamas. Um, through a supreme effort, an individual can awaken the Buddha spirit within and achieve enlightenment in a single lifetime. Uh, so the people who are running Tibet were this um, monarchy, uh, and the head of the monarchy was the Lamas, and then they had nobility. Uh, and they would pick the Lamas in this very uh, kind of spiritual and esoteric way. Um, but it's important to remember, if you're thinking of the Dalai Lama nowadays, you're probably thinking of someone, you know, who's in exile and traveling around, talking about peace and such. 
Uh, but these early lamas, they were military leaders. Uh, and when we see their palace, we'll see exactly what I'm talking about. So some of these pieces um, are influenced by sculpture. Uh, you see similar sculptures to this in Cambodia as well. So with this kind of like pointed form um, for the auxiliary brain, uh, you know, eyes that are very close together um, and, you know, kind of flowing garments going throughout. It's very hierarchic. So again, like medieval um, Byzantine um, art in Europe. And the idea is that the image and the spirit are one. Uh, so these are not only didactic, but they can have kind of a spiritual resonance in themselves. So this is a Patala monastery palace. And if you're looking at this and you think it looks like a fortress, that's because it is. Uh, again, these were military leaders. Remember, they, they were kind of driven uh, by, here by foreign powers. So people look to the lamas to protect them with military force. Um, this one was built by the fifth Dalai Lama. Uh, so a fortress down here, but quite beautiful things up top. So this isn't a typical room in the interior, just filled with luxuries wall to wall. Everything is beautiful and decorated. Um, so again, that's what you tend to see with these uh, rather autocratic uh, monarchies is this display of wealth. 